Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 76 of UAB Green and Told, original debut July 18th, 2022. Through our podcast, we have the chance to share stories from members of the UAB community. Want to listen to past episodes? We can be found at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told on Spotify or the Apple podcast app. While there, leave a written review so other alumni can find us as well. I'm Greg Berry, a 15-time UAB alum and Supreme Director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. So if you've listened closely to my open and are one of our loyal listeners, you're probably thinking something's off. Well, you're right. I'm not the Supreme Director of my office, nor do I have 15 degrees from UAB. Today, we're talking about deception and lies with Dr. Timothy Levine, Distinguished Professor and Chair of the UAB Department of Communication Studies. As Dr. Levine will share, he's had a lifelong fascination with the way people tick. Every human is is different in, in just this whole unique constellation and clusters of ways. Um, and it's this unique constellation of, of idiosyncrasies we have that, that make us us. Plus, while one lie may unravel all your truths, Dr. Levine will shed light on why he believes honesty and truth aren't necessarily the same thing. I don't think of honesty as a bluntness. Okay. So I don't think of honesty as truth and nothing but the truth. And let's face it, some people are good liars. As we'll discover, you won't believe that the things that make a good liar also make a good honest person. There are some people who are really good at it. And the things that make you a good liar are also the things that make you a good honest person. Lying is part of daily life. No, really, think about it. When was the last time you told a lie? Maybe you told somebody that an email must have gotten lost in my spam folder, or perhaps you're too embarrassed to admit that you don't remember an old classmate and assure them by saying, yeah, I remember you. Lies are spun all the time. In fact, most of us lie a couple of times a day. But why do we lie, and why are we so deceitful? Dr. Timothy Levine has made a career out of studying deception and sheds light on the topic. Before we delve into deceit, though, we have to understand how his interests turned away from rocks, of all things, as a youngster. I had a a rock collection, which I was quite proud of, uh, with things I had, you know, rocks I had found, interesting rocks I had found, and I could tell you, you know, what a quartz was and, you know, be able to spot it when I was walking around the desert. And I had a, a cousin who... Uh, was a geologist and worked for one of the big kind of local mining companies. And so when everybody else wanted to be uh, a fireman or a policeman, or at least all the the little boys, uh, I wanted to be a a geologist. And I had this kind of interest in physical sciences up until about the time I hit high school. What changed once you hit high school? Because the interest did shift ultimately. I mean, here you are, you are, you know, a, a scholar, when it comes down to it, you know, English communication, communication more. So what changed? Well, I still consider myself a scientist, okay. but in junior high and high school, what changed was social dynamics, school politics and, you know, kid politics. I mean, there was always some of that right through grade school, but it, it really just was such a big part of, I think, every junior high and high school student in the world's life, right? Is the social dynamics that were going on. And I just found this really, really, really fascinating. You know, I'm just, why do people do what they do? And ultimately, I think to me, it's just more interesting than why is a rock the way it is? You know, it, it seems to me that, you know, rocks are the way they are. It's, it's you know, it's, it's simple and more straightforward and less, Less of a good puzzle, uh, but people, people are incredible puzzles. Did you find yourself trying to read people? Uh, yes, read people, understand people, and uh, understand what I would call individual differences, right? So every human is is different in, in just this whole unique constellation and clusters of ways. Um, and it's this unique constellation of of idiosyncrasies we have that that make us us. And it, it, it seems to me that understanding that's kind of essential to getting along and 
and social functioning. When you went off to school, you obviously kind of steered towards communications. Is that right? Uh, so when I went off to college, uh, I was a psychology major. Okay. Knew I was going to be a psychology major. Uh, and I had communication classes. I had a class in nonverbal communication and uh, a class in persuasion and a class in uh, presidential campaign rhetoric. I stayed, uh, I stayed a psychology major, but I picked up more and more and more uh, communication classes. And I think I ended up with maybe just like one credit short of a dual major. Okay, so close. So at what point during the academic career did kind of deceit, uh, deception, lies, truth-telling, when did that kind of arise? Um, maybe about halfway through my PhD program, a little bit more than halfway through my uh, PhD program. I went to grad school to study persuasion. One of my favorite classes in my undergrad days was, uh, was a persuasion class. And that's what I did my... Uh, master's thesis on, and that's what I did my uh, doctoral dissertation on. And my, my second real interest was interpersonal communication, which was in some ways even closer to kind of why I wanted to be a social scientist in the first, in the first place. I'm interested in psychology, but kind of more kind of normal everyday people. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really interested in disorders or I'm interested in everyday everyday social behavior, everyday functioning. Uh, and it was about halfway through my PhD program that uh, my university hired a new professor uh, who studied deception. I got assigned to his, to work on him as being his research assistant. I, I didn't get attracted to deception for the topic itself, at least initially. I got there another way and what happened was, is sometimes you do a study, you get results, but they actually lead to more questions. Having a little bit of tenaciousness in me, uh, I kind of started tugging on those strings. One of the really, really cool things about deception is nothing is what it seems in deception. Uh, so much of social science is kind of uh, common sense and obvious. And you tell people and they're like, why would you study this? This is like so obvious, but that's not the case with deception at all. Um, so, so there was an element of opportunism in it. There were some big questions that need to be answered. There was kind of, uh, it was an area where I could, I could make a splash. There's huge advantages to studying things that are, that a lot of people find intrinsically interesting. When they're on a little bit of kind of a more anti-social spectrum, of human behavior, there's some disadvantages to studying those uh, too, you know, because being doctor of deception isn't, isn't always a, a good thing. And certainly some people respond to what I do as, as kind of off-putting and, uh, uh, but most people, most people find it really interesting. I and mean, there's just, there's, there's good payoff if other people are interested in your work. At the ground level, what is the difference between a lie and deceit or deception, is there a difference? I would consider this question to fall in the realm of issues of definition, right? And words don't have one meaning and there's no kind of meaning police, right? Or meaning dictator. So words mean what I mean by them and nothing else. But the way I think about them is I think about deception as the broader category. And I think about lying as a subtype of of kind of the prototypical and most obvious subtype of deception. So I tend to think of lying as kind of something that's uh, outright false, uh, kind of knowingly, intentionally, purposely done uh, to mislead somebody. But there's all these kind of more subtle ways to deceive people that maybe we wouldn't call a lie, but clearly people get fooled by them. For the most part, everybody on earth lies. Everybody has a little deceit in them. Is this kind of what you have found through your research and through the work that you've done? I'm very reluctant to say everybody lies. Uh, first, it's hard to test everybody, right? So it's like claiming everybody has a unique fingerprint. Well, how would you know? How many fingerprints have you looked at? Right? Because everybody's an awfully large number. 
Uh, I did a diary study that was just published where people tracked uh, their lying behavior for three months. And there were two people out of 600 uh, that at least claimed that they didn't lie over those three months. So I think if you just talk to people about this, you will run into people who will say they can't lie. They're just really, really, really bad at it. They know they're bad at it. Um, and because they know they're bad at it, they almost never do it. I think there's kind of 1% of the population lies very, very little. Maybe once every 10 days, once every two weeks. Uh, there might be a subset of those people who lie much, much less frequently than that. Then there's what I might call the kind of normative, honest majority. And for the, this might be 75% of the population. They lie on any given day, maybe not at all, maybe once, maybe twice. So there might be some especially challenging days for them where, you know, they might tell three or four lies. But on any given day, probably they'll lie maybe once or twice. Uh, then there's another group who kind of lie more than that. And then there's this kind of top 1% who are just uh, out of control liars. Is there a reason why people are deceitful? Unless you're just kind of pathological. And, and even this is debat debatable. Um, a psychologist named Chris Hart just posted on his Psych Today blog. Um, so I, I kind of define pathological lying as lying without a reason. And... Um, Dr. Hart thinks that even, even pathological liars have a reason. It's just their reasoning is different than is rational, makes sense to the rest of us. Pathological liars aside, which is debatable. Uh, yeah, it's, it's for some reason, uh, the truth is unpalatable, right? There's some something about the communication situation where, so I, I tend to think of kind of honest communication is the default. And, and let me be clear, I don't think of honesty as uh, bluntness. Okay. So I don't think of honesty as truth and nothing but the truth. It's not, not a virtue to be a jerk and, and say mean things to people if you're thinking. That's, that's kind of not, in my view, that's not honest. But, you know, you're not, you're not trying to mislead people. You want to be understood. And, and we go ahead and this is kind of our default mode of communication. And most of our communication, we don't, we don't generally plan what we're gonna say. Even though I knew I was gonna be on this podcast, I didn't script out what I was gonna say. This, I'm, I'm constructing this on the fly. And I don't know what five words from now is gonna be. So I'll, I'll go along and I'll just kind of do my communication business as usual until there's some kind of roadblock. And it occurs to me, Oh, I can't say that. So when the, oh, I better not say that comes, I just edit that out. Now, if I'm editing something out and you come back with a question, now I can't just leave it out anymore, right? Now I can either say something false. I can try to spin, obscure it, maybe take the conversation in a little different direction. But, you know, if there's, if there's nothing wrong with what I'm saying, then I'll just say what I'm saying. If I can't say that, then I'll just kind of do a little, oh, I need to edit a little bit, kind of on the fly. And I'll probably only be false if you either ask me a direct question or if for some reason I'm trying to be preemptive, right? And I, I know this is going to come up. So, uh, so I'm going to do something false. The web gets weaved and tangled more and more as the shovel kind of goes into the ground and you start digging to try to get yourself out of the initial lie. Potentially, but my guess is that doesn't happen very much because we give other people uh, uh, so much latitude in their communication. So, you know, most times this probably happened. The other person, the person you're talking to is completely unaware. Everybody forgets what was said and we never have to worry about it again. It's only these kind of important uh, falsehoods or when somebody's suspicious that that web weaving becomes uh, critical or, or, you know, there is a, there is a class of deception out there that's very strategic and very planned. You know, you know, in advance, you're going to do it and you, you make up, you have a story already made up and 
Uh, but I, I tend to think that this is um, a very small sliver of, of deception. I, I don't think humans are especially strategic. Some, some people are, some of the time, but I've seen very, very, very little evidence that people in their everyday life are playing kind of multi-dimensional chess. People are much more autopilot sort of social actors. Is it easy to spot a lie? Because people do it, you know people are doing it, but is it something you can kind of pick out and go, wait a minute, they're not being truthful? Uh, the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, these days, the examples for yes, it's incredibly easy I like to give are um, the kind of spamming and phishing text messages I get on a daily basis. I keep hoping my, my cell phone software will get better at screening these out. You know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that I didn't just get this $10,000 uh, stimulus that all I have to do is reply winter uh, to get. And to my knowledge so far, I haven't fallen for one. And I, I don't think most people, so our, our hit rate on these is incredibly high. Now, some people fall for them, right? But it's, it's this uh, game of large numbers where they're gonna send out literally billions of these, right? And one out of every 100,000 or one out of every million, somebody's going to fall for it. And, and, and that's going to be enough to make the scam work. That, that type of deception is easy. The little white lies, um, my guess is uh, we never detect. I think we're incredibly vulnerable to identity deception, things like catfishing, where people aren't who they say they are. Mm -hmm. And it just never occurs to us that they might be something other, you know, so I can't fake you out because you were, you know, we, we know each other from, you know, from a class, but with people you never met before, they're not going to pick up on that immediately unless you're doing something really to set off the radar. So there has to be something to set off the radar. Um, it varies hugely from situation to situation. You have done research that was funded by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Defense, as well as the FBI, among others. You're doing this because people can be really good liars, I'm guessing, and they want to know how you can figure out what's going on with the bad guys, basically. What makes a good liar a good liar? Almost everybody is a good liar. Uh, there's a few people who can't lie and they're bad liars. Uh, but those, those I think are a pretty small number. I think most of us learn how to do this uh, in adolescent years. And, and by kind of middle to late teens, we can all pull off a lie in a pinch. There are some people who are really good at it. And the things that make you a good liar are also the things that make you a good, honest person. No kidding. So the same things that will make somebody credible and believable when they're being honest will make them credible and believable when they're not being honest. So there's a whole package of behaviors that make you seem sincere. You know, things like having confidence. It's, I, it's the friendly extroverts. The friendly extroverts are, are compelling and, and people believe them. And when the friendly extrovert is honest, uh, people are right about them. And when the friendly extroverts are dishonest, uh, people get fooled. Uh, more text, text environments. Uh, a lot of it has to do with plausibility. If it, it sounds reasonable, if it's not too weird, it's probably going to be a leaf. Uh, the other thing, I, if I'm telling you things that match your pre-existing beliefs and that people around you also believe, I think you've almost certainly going to believe it, whether it's true or whether it's false. So uh, preaching to the choir, deceptive preaching to the choir is, is incredibly deceptive because <laughs> uh, the choir doesn't, right? The choir wants to hear what, what, they're, what they're being preached. As humans, we kind, of, we kind of want to have a certain amount of honesty in our lives, I imagine. So how do we go about our daily lives knowing that, you know what, Dr. Levine might have just lied to me. You know, Greg might have lied to me. How do we, how do we live on a day-to-day -day basis knowing that we kind of want the honest factor involved? 
My solution to this personally is to not worry about it unless it's something that's really important. So if I'm going to make a major purchase, then I do my homework. Uh, you know, I'm probably not going to buy a house without an inspection. And I'm probably not going to let my realtor, no matter how much I like them, get the inspector. You know, I'm not going to make investments without doing some due diligence. So I'm not going to make major important life decisions. On the other hand, in everyday communication, most people are pretty honest. You're, the odds are, if you just accept what people say, so, so most communication is honest. Of the communication that's not honest, most deception is about trivial little things that don't really matter in life. So you only really need to worry about this tiny, tiny little sliver of communication. If I've treated you in a way in the past where you can't be honest with me, you know you can't. And I, I, I've seen this in, in meetings, right? With, uh, with people in power who, when there's a little bit of dissent, just shut down. Mm-hmm the alternative views and, and people learn, you know, they want to keep their jobs and uh, they learn, don't speak truth to power. And, and then, then deception becomes a problem. But I think in most of our everyday life, it's, it's only these tiny slivers of things where we have to worry about. With everything you've done, would you be good at the two lies and a truth game? No, probably not. Why not? I'm not... I'm not a horrible liar, but I'm not especially good at it. And everything I know about detecting deception leads me to believe that the way you do it isn't by how people are coming off. When I want to find out if if somebody's lying to me, I try to do a little research or or background or or have some external information or have a really good uh, knowledge of the situation. So in most deception games are, are really hard because they're always kind of decontextualized. They deprive the person of the uh, type of information that would be really diagnostic. That's Dr. Timothy Levine. Dr. Levine came to UAB in 2015 and is the distinguished professor in the College of Arts and Sciences and chairs the Department of Communication Studies. He is the author or co-author of Information Manipulation Theory, Truth Default Theory, The Veracity Effect, The Probing Effect, and the Park Levine Probability Model. His research on deception has been funded by the National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Defense, and the FBI. True to his word, he definitely has an idea of what it means to be a blazer. UAB is a fairly unique place. So it's this... R1 state school that is unlike most R1 state schools. So if you would compare, you know, UAB to Auburn or Tuscaloosa, our students are much more in-state. They are much more ethnically and racially diverse. Uh, They are much more likely to be first generation. They are much more likely to be working their way through school. So most kind of state in state universities that you know kind of have UAB's academic structure might have fraternity sororities you know the students come from fairly well-off families they're going to be okay no matter what uh parents are paying for a school you know they're not just partying on the weekends there's you know Thursday night's a big party night uh you know they have the strip or the equivalent of the bar scene and this isn't UAB Right, UAB students are um, are struggling. They're you know they're working. They have multiple jobs. Their their lives are full. Uh, they are not going to Florida on spring break. You know they're they're working, and UAB is changing their lives in a way that most universities don't change the lives of most students. You know UAB this is giving students an opportunity. That, that they might not have absent UAB. When you ask me what it means to be a blazer, it's it's to, you know, play a part in this endeavor of, you know, changing the lives of uh, our students and, 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 the, and the families of our students in, in really meaningful, really meaningful ways. And that I think distinguishes UAB from uh, most other 
kind of same level peer institutions. Be sure to listen into previous episodes of UAB Green and Told. Check out our website at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Have a story to share or know someone we need to get in touch with? Email greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search UAB Alumni. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go Blazers.